One. You will hear a woman and a man talking about their work at a library. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, I'm Mrs. Phillips, the head librarian. You're the new library assistant, aren't you? Yes, I'm Robert Haskell, but please call me Bob. All right, Bob. Let me take a few minutes to explain how the library works and what your duties will be. First. The library opens at 8.30 in the morning, so naturally we expect you to be here and ready to work by then. Of course. And you can go home at 4.30 when the library closes. Now, let me explain where everything's kept. It looks like here on the ground floor is where the reference books are. Yes, that's right. Up on the second floor is where the adult collection is, both fiction and non-fiction. And the children's books are there too, aren't they? I thought I saw them in the room by the stairway. No, those are magazines and newspapers for adults. Children's books are up one more flight on the third floor. We'll take a look at them later. Let me show you how we organize our work. Do you see that brown book cart over there? The one by the door? Yes, that one. Those books have been checked in and need to go back on the shelves. Okay, so the brown book cart has books to reshelve. What about this black cart by the desk? Those books have torn pages or damaged covers. They're all books that need to be repaired. Okay, I know how to do a lot of that. I'm pretty good at mending torn pages and covers. That's great, because we really need help with that. And that white cart in the corner, what are those books for? Those are old books that we've taken off the shelves to make room for new ones. We sell them as used books to raise money for the library. So they're all ready to sell? Yes, that's right. So now you know what to do with the books in the carts. Let's talk about our activities schedule. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. I understand this library has a number of interesting activities every week. Yes, our activities are quite popular. The most popular one is story time for the children. Do a lot of children show up for that? Yes, a good many. It takes place in the children's room on Thursday mornings at 11. Isn't there a family movie night too? Yes, but it's not at night anymore. We used to have family movies on Fridays when the library is open until 9, but now we have a different activity at that time, so we had to switch family movies to the weekend, Saturday afternoon. How much do you charge for the movies? They're all free. The movie always starts at 2.30 in the reference room, but you don't have to worry about that since you don't work on weekends. And what takes place on Friday evenings? We've just started a weekly lecture series. We have a different speaker every week, and the lectures cover all different kinds of topics. That sounds like something I'd be interested in attending. Good, because we'll need your help with that. You'll be working Friday evenings, and one of your duties will be to set up the meeting room on the first floor for the lecture. What time will you need that done? Let's say by 6.15. The lecture starts at 6.30, and the room needs to be ready well ahead of time. A lot of people arrive early. Maybe I should have the room ready by 6? That wouldn't be a bad idea. OK, why don't I take you upstairs and show you the rest of the collection?
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear three university students talking about a presentation which one of them has to give. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. First, look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully. Hi, Joe. Hi, Isabel. Hi, Paul. Oh, hi, Paul. I've heard you've been stressing out about your presentation on art. I am. Are you still going to talk about the different types of art? Yes. Well, I was planning to, but there's so much stuff on the subject that I'm finding it difficult to put it all into one short presentation. Huh. I usually have the opposite problem. There's nothing worse than going blank, forgetting your words, in front of a group of people. Well, the problem is that I don't know how to organize what I want to say in the presentation. Well, you know everything there is to know about the subject. It's just a question of selecting what you want to talk about. Well, there's a lot to discuss about the different periods in art. That's a good way to start. Then. You can bring in how specific types of art were popular in each period. Yes, like how sculpture was popular in the classical period and paintings were popular in the Renaissance period. And how now a wide variety of media are used to create modern art. As long as you keep it concise because it's a large area, there are so many periods and movements in art and you don't want to just list them one by one. I agree. An explanation of the movements and periods in art wouldn't be too long. You're right. I need to just pick out some key points. Just mention the periods quickly so that I can move on to the real topic of the presentation. Yes, the variety of art, like sculpture, paintings, installations. I have an idea. Why don't you prepare a timeline to show to the class? That would be a nice visual, and it would focus your ideas so you don't get too sidetracked. Great idea. It would certainly cut down on time. Right then. Where are we? You'll begin with a very short introduction to the historical periods of art. Then, you'll talk about popular types of art within these periods. That's sorted. Maybe you could also mention some key works of art in each period. Like the Venus de Milo statue, or the screen by Edvard Munch, and give some interesting facts on them? That's not a bad idea, because it does give people a frame of reference when I talk about specific kinds of art. After giving a historical context, I should really talk about different forms of art, shouldn't I? Yes, you should. After that, you can conclude with a question on what is considered to be art, now, that would be really interesting. Yes, comparing the traditional views of art with modern views. Exactly. I think I'll have a collection of pictures, including famous pieces of art from classic to modern, 
projected on the wall, like the Mona Lisa and some pop art, and ask people whether they think it's art or not. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Showing some famous works and asking people what art is would certainly lead to discussion in the room. People's appreciation of art is so subjective, and it comes down to taste. That's what I'm hoping for, some disagreement to liven up the presentation. And you could stick in some really controversial ones like graffiti and modern art installations in between pieces of art that are universally accepted, like the work of the Renaissance painters. Sounds good to me. I have to say I really don't understand some modern art myself. There was one recently that was just a pile of rubbish. It doesn't require much skill to create, does it? And what does it mean? There's no point to it. Actually, Joe, I like some modern art. It makes you look at the world in a different way. Artists now have the freedom to express themselves completely. Yes, but there is an idea now that anything can be art. I've heard of paintings being sold for large sums of money, which have been done by small children and animals. Now that's ridiculous. Oh, you could find one of those paintings and put it in your presentation, couldn't you, Paul? That would really be interesting. Well, Paul, what do you think? I like it. Just thinking. I'll need to do some more research to find pictures for the slideshow. Yes, we can help you, can't we, Joe? Of course. If you go to the fine art section of the library, I'm sure you'll find everything you need. Just ask the staff and they'll give you access to a slide bank of hundreds of famous works of art. And if you still can't find what you're looking for, use the library computers to go online. There are lots of images on the internet. Of course, you'll need to use a search engine like Google, but it's dead easy. Thanks, guys. I'm feeling much clearer about the project. Your ideas have been really useful. I think I should end with a quote of some kind by a famous artist. What do you think? That's a good idea. Now let's go to the library and see what they have. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a reporter talking on the radio about old racing cars. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. The Goodwood Museum is currently celebrating some of the most extravagant types of car design in its Festival of Speed. Here's our reporter, Vincent Fried, who's on site to tell us about some of the cars on display. 
Well, here I am, standing in front of one of the most prestigious cars ever built, the Duesenberg. A fantastically expensive, luxurious car built in the early part of the 20th century and bearing all the glamorous qualities of the Jazz Age. How many were there? Well, only 473 Duesenberg J-types were ever built, and the model here is one of the rarest. Each had a short 125-inch chassis or framework, and the body was always in the form of an open two-seater. The technology behind the car's 6.9-litre engine was extraordinary. It featured capsules of mercury in the engines to absorb vibration and provide an incredibly smooth ride. In fact, these cars offered unparalleled performance. In an age when 160 kilometers per hour was considered very fast, the Duesenberg promised a top speed of 180 kilometers per hour and could do 140 kilometers per hour in second gear. Duesenberg, who designed the car, sold it as a frame and engine. This was typical of the age again, and many prestige manufacturers such as Rolls-Royce did exactly the same. Owners able to afford the hefty $9,000 price tag for the basic car would then commission a coachwork company to build a body tailored to their own individual requirements. The Duesenberg's great attraction for the driver was its instrument panel, which offered all the usual features, but also several others, including a stopwatch. It was the Duesenberg's technology that lay behind its success as a racing car, and they dominated the American racing scene in the 1920s, winning the Indianapolis Grand Prix in 1924, 25 and 27. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. On to another celebrity, the 1922 Leia Helica. Only 30 of these French propeller cars were built, and the model here at Goodwood, which was the fourth to be made, is thought to be the only surviving example still capable of running. The brains behind this car was Marcel Leia, who was an aviation pioneer first and foremost, and the influence of flying is quite apparent in the car. The Leia very strongly resembles a light aircraft with its front propeller, but in this case, it's minus any wings, of course. It's quite odd to think that this car was whirring through France just as the Duesenberg was blasting down roads at 160 kilometers per hour across the Atlantic. The Leias were used regularly in France in the 1920s and were even produced in saloon and van form, as well as two-seater. The Leia matched its propeller drive with its equally bizarre steering, which used the rear rather than the front wheels. But despite looking rather frail, it was a tough machine. In fact, when troops tried to steal it during the Second World War, the car's baffling design was clearly beyond the would-be thieves, and it ended up being driven into a tree, breaking the propeller. And now for the Firebird, this extraordinary car. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a man giving a lecture on nuclear fusion. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. I'd like to start by thanking so many of you for attending this, my first public lecture at this magnificent university. I'm going to be talking to you today about nuclear fusion. Before I proceed further, I would like to apologize on behalf of some of our newspapers for the sensationalist and hopelessly inaccurate articles that have been published on the subject over the years. I must confess that my own interest in the subject was actually stimulated by an article published more than 50 years ago in a popular Sunday tabloid with the impressive title, Power from the Sea. Today, most people would probably interpret such a title as an introduction to a discussion on the latest developments in renewable energy sources, such as wave technology or generating electricity from tidal flows. But back then, little, if any, progress had been made in these fields since the invention of the water wheel. As I recall, following coverage of the opening of the world's first commercial nuclear power station more than 50 years ago now at Calder Hall in 1956, the article promised that we would have limitless, almost free electricity within 10 years. It claimed that we could do this using an isotope of water, deuterium, from the sea. This would be used in reactors to combine simple molecules of hydrogen to form helium, releasing energy in the process. Of course, this is different from the process of nuclear fission, which today's nuclear reactors use. I wouldn't like to say that the article I read as a boy was totally inaccurate. It's true that the concept of producing energy from nuclear fusion essentially reproducing the reactions by which our sun and other stars produce energy, depends on fusing atoms of hydrogen. But the time scale suggested was hopelessly wrong. To this day, despite some very embarrassing false claims from scientists who should have known better, we have not been able to produce energy from nuclear fusion in a controllable way. Let me make clear what I mean by this statement before some journalist in the audience gets hold of the wrong end of the stick. Yes, we have been able to fuse hydrogen atoms to produce helium and a release of energy, but the balance account has always been negative. We've always had to put more energy into the reaction than we've ever succeeded in getting out. We know the theory works but we still do not know if we can get fusion to work for us and solve the problem of our energy needs. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. Here, I will briefly explain these problems before going on to give you a summary of the innovative ways being tested to overcome them. First of all, we have to try to understand the incredible physical conditions that exist inside a natural nuclear fusion reactor, such as the sun. To start with, we have to create temperatures never experienced on our planet. Indeed, if we had experienced the temperatures required, then our planet would never have formed. We have to generate temperatures of at least 100 million degrees Celsius in a carefully controlled environment before we can even hope to produce a fusion reaction. The problems are immense, but it can be done. Many of you will know that you can put your hand into a very hot oven and not get burnt, provided you do not touch any of the surfaces. I won't go into the reasons for this phenomenon here, but we are applying roughly the same principles in designs for fusion reactors. I think I can promise you that the heat will be confined to a very small area. The other major problem we have to find a solution to is pressure. The pressures in a massive body like the sun are vast, 
And this is what brings the hydrogen atoms into such close proximity to one another that they fuse into helium. We may not have to achieve the same pressures in a fusion reactor, but even so, it is a huge technological problem. What, then, makes me hopeful about the future of energy from nuclear fusion? Perhaps surprisingly, it is developments in laser technology. We can now use lasers to control the nuclear fuel pellets so that they remain suspended inside the reactor without touching the sides. Remember that these pellets are quite small, and because they contain atoms of deuterium and tritium, the two isotopic forms of hydrogen that can be used in these reactions, they are quite light. The lasers will also compress the fuel pellet to raise the pressure to that required to initiate the fusion reaction. Another, far more powerful laser will be used to heat the fuel pellet to the temperature required. This laser, if you like, will act as the trigger to start the reaction. Once started, it is hoped that the reaction will produce enough energy to maintain itself, and also that it will produce a surplus in the form of heat that can be used to produce the steam needed to drive turbines in order to generate the electricity the world needs. To give you some idea of how much energy we can produce, it has been calculated that just one kilogram of fusion fuel is capable of producing the same amount of energy as 10,000 tons of fossil fuel. I think you would agree that such an objective is worth working towards. I believe, and I am not alone in this, that nuclear fusion could supply the world's energy needs for centuries to come. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.